So hi everyone, my name is Brandon, I'm a junior here at the College studying Computer Science, and today we're going to talk about Kahana, which is a PHP web development framework. And today's going to be a live coding seminar, so I'm basically going to spend five, ten minutes just sort of explaining what Kahana is, and then I'm just literally going to build a super simple vlog for you right here. We're literally from scratch, like we're going to download the code from the Kahana website, and we're just going to start building a blog. And Hopefully it'll be very instructive because you'll kind of see perhaps maybe I'll make some mistakes and you'll see me recover from them or you'll just kind of see my thought process that I built through this blog and meanwhile you'll also kind of get familiar with the framework itself. So hopefully it'll be a very instructive exercise. All right. So first, what exactly is a framework? So if you've been taking CS50 so far, you haven't really worked with any frameworks yet. And the thing is this, so you've probably done one web development uh, piece of already. And let's say you continue to build websites and you keep building websites, you'll start to notice a few things. The first thing you'll notice is that you're probably doing the same things over and over again all the time. Things like um, cleaning user input data, um, things like you know, organizing your files in a certain way. Um, the other thing you'll also probably notice is that your code may start to become very, very messy. And you may just leave it messy and just have a very hard time maintaining it, or you may start to structure your code and making it modular in certain ways to make it more maintainable. And this is where web frameworks basically came in. These people who had built a lot of websites, they said, you know, we don't need to redo this every single time we build a website. Why don't we just make a package that does all these things for you every single time you want to build a website, and so that when you make a new website, you just focus on exactly what this particular website is about, and you don't need to repeat all the various configuration and um, separation of codes and you know, build, rewriting code that you often have to do when you're making websites. Okay. So the idea is that you know, a framework allows you to write higher level code without having to worry about lower level details. So a lower level detail might be something like um, dealing with uh, cleaning user input data. Right? That's something that you shouldn't really need to worry about. You should focus on what your web application is actually about. Okay, so it eliminates a lot of boilerplate code and adds an architecture for your project. The most popular one would be model view controller, which I'm going to talk about in a sec. And a lot of times these frameworks embody a set of procedures, rules, and uh, best practices for you to use so that when you adopt the web framework, you have to write your code in a certain way and it's generally a agreed upon set of principles by the community that is generally accepted to be a good way of writing code. It, it makes your code more maintainable, more usable, so on and so forth. And finally, the thing I want to emphasize about frameworks versus libraries is this idea about inversion of control. And the thing is this, so the difference between a library and a framework is that with a library, you are still writing the main the main program and you're sort of invoking the library and calling upon a library to do something for you. The difference between a library and a framework is that the framework starts out with the control and it invokes your code. So you can think of it as the framework, that this is why it's called a framework, the framework sort of provides this frame and structure for your code and you sort of fill in the holes. All right? And this, this will become more apparent in a second when you see me start to write code within the context of the framework and you'll see that I'm just sort of filling in the gaps and the framework is kind of controlling all the moving pieces, and I just sort of have to put the pieces in the right places. Okay? So today we're going to talk about Kahana, which is one of many PHP frameworks. So there are web frameworks, and there are ones written in every single language, and I'm picking Kahana because Kahana is arguably and generally recognized as the uh, easiest PHP framework to pick up. It's um, the most lightweight. Uh, there are other ones out there that come with many, many, many more features, but they tend to be uh, more difficult to pick up. And finally, Kahana uses the MVC architecture. So it's lightweight enough that we can literally just build a project right here, right in front of your eyes, and you can pretty much follow along pretty easily. <coughs> so what is the MVC architecture? It stands for Model View Controller. And maybe if you think about the code that you've been writing so far for some of your web development piece sets, you may be able to see some of this, but usually when you start writing a more complex web, web application, the sort of division between these three segments will become more evident. <coughs> okay, uh, so I'm kind of I kind of laid out the MVC here, sort of as a stack, and often you'll hear people talk about stacks in web development, and this is just to illustrate the idea that um, each each sort of layer, each sort of component, really tries to only communicate between two other components. All right, someone uh, accesses your your website as a client or a browser. They sort of interact with your, um, your program through the view code. The view code sort of interacts with the controller. The controller interacts with the model, and the model interacts with the SQL database. Okay? And there's no sort of hopping in between if you write your code properly. Okay? So what do, what, do, what do these things do? So the model essentially is the piece of code that just deals with your data. 
Okay, anything that deals with your database, with the objects that you store, or retrieving those objects in the database, that's all handled by the model. Okay? So maybe you have objects in your database. We're going we're gonna to create a model uh, having to do with posts. So like a post may have certain attributes to it. You may have functions uh, around storing those posts or retrieving posts or you know, filtering the posts and so on and so forth. And that's all the code that's handled by the model. The controller is sort of the application logic. And uh, this is sort of where it, 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 a lot of different things can go in the application logic. Um, if you're talking to a different API, that may be where you're dealing with the application logic. Um, if you're trying to have to bring in um, data from multiple different models and have to combine them in some way, that often may be handled by the controller. Um, for example, on Facebook, if you're friends someone, then perhaps um, you know, that act of you know, establishing that relationship may be done by the controller. Okay, and finally, the view is sort of the code around just generating what you actually see. So a lot of times, I think, in the CS50 um, P sets, they don't really encourage you guys to separate these three things. You'll probably have this big, long file where at the top you make some SQL query, you maybe do some processing on the data you retrieved from the database, and then you'll just have like, all your HTML at the bottom. And you may find that as you create more and more pages that you know, you're going to have some code repetition. And also, the thing is, your, your file just get really big and long and become unwieldy to manage. Okay. The reason why MVC is so well regarded is for a number of reasons. The first thing is something called separation of concerns, which is the idea that you know, when you have, ideally, one piece of code should just do one thing and do it really well. And you shouldn't combine pieces of code that do sort of disparate things. So for example, view code and model code, they don't really have to be related. They don't have to be in the same file. So when you can, separate them out so it's easier to maintain. The other thing is code reuse. You may find yourself writing the same SQL query or doing sort of similar queries that could be abstracted into one function. And that's the idea behind models and controllers, having it in a separate function that you can reuse in different p places in your project. And finally, that's sort of tied to uh, drying your code or don't not repeating yourself. Don't repeat yourself. This is a very common principle in uh, development. Um, whenever you can, you don't want to repeat yourself because if you repeat yourself, it just means you it's just much more costly to maintain. Um, if you want to change one thing, you have to change it everywhere. And you know, that leads to bugs, and it's horrible. All right. So. Any questions so far about Kahana at all? Great. So now we're going to dive into the live coding session. And hopefully, everything goes well. All right. <coughs> so I am going to basically build this website on one of my remote servers, and that way you guys can also see the website and access the website, and also I can sort of just, um, the environment's better configured on my remote machine because it's running Linux instead of OS X. All right, so we're just literally going to start kahanaframer.org, okay? I'm literally going to download the code from the website, so I'm just going to copy the link address, go to my server, download it, and I'm going to extract it. So, oh, is that is that better? Yeah, that's fine. So I just downloaded a zip file and unzip that into a directory called Kahana. I'm going to rename that CS50 Kahana. And let's go in. Awesome. So here you see a, a bunch of different files. Um, most of you can ignore. Um, we're not going to go through every single file that's in here because of our, uh, our time constraints. But generally, when you install Kahana, the first thing you do is you just go to, you go to the directory. And it will basically do some environment tests and whatnot to make sure your environment is properly set up to run Kahana and make sure that everything is all right. So you can see most things pass, but you generally always run into this one problem where it complains that some directory is not writable, and that's just because of some permissions. And I don't know how much of you guys have learned about file permissions in CS50, but if you do web development, you're going to run into this issue a lot. <laughs> so I'm just going to make it writable. And I think I also have to do well. There we go. OK, so now you can see 
everything passed, and now they just tell you to rename the install.php file. So I'm going to move the install.php file to install.php. And now if I refresh, it gives me some error, and this is where the debugging comes in. Or this is where you can see what I'm actually, what's actually going to happen. So the thing is, by default, Kahana assumes that your project is at the root directory of your domain. So it's expecting you to be at you know, demo.brandkw.com. But I have to tell it that it's actually in a subfolder. It's in a subfolder called cs50kahana. So the thing is, it's misinterpreting cs50-kahana as something else, which I'll explain to you in a sec. Um, but I should tell it that that's sort of something that's to be expected. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to go into this folder called bootstrap.php, which is sort of the configuration folder where a lot of different things are set up. OK, so I open that up. Then maybe one of the first things I'll do is change the time zone. And then, let's see, uh -huh, right here. So this is, there's some, there are a bunch of different configuration settings in here, but the one I'm looking for is here's this thing called base URL. And by default, I get it set to Kahana, um, but I'm gonna change that to CS50 Kahana. And I think that should fix it. Yes, great. So by default, you know, to see that it's working, it says hello world, okay? So where did that come from? How do we get to hello world? Uh, where exactly is the code that actually wrote that? So to understand that, I'm going to introduce this concept called routing. Okay, so pretty much all web frameworks have the concept called routing, which is you know, the, the sort of the piece of the, the software that will map a certain URL to a certain piece of code within your framework. Okay? So for example, if you have some URL and you go to some URL like foo.com slash blog slash all, okay, then what the framework is going to do, it's going to find, or at least what Kahana is going to do, it's going to find a class called controller blog, okay, and it's going to run the function named action all. Okay? I know I'm talking about classes and functions. I know you guys, ha you guys haven't covered classes and functions um, in uh, CS50 yet, but for now, you can just think of classes as just a group of functions, okay? just a way of sort of grouping functions together. Um, that's enough for, that's really all you need to know. Okay? So now if we look at uh, our folder structure, okay, un inside the application folder, there's another folder called classes, and you have two another folder called controller and model. So you look inside the controller model, sorry, the controller folder, we see that there's a, a file called welcome, okay? And you can see here is a class called controller welcome, okay, and there's a function called action index, and what it does is it sets the body of your response to hello world. Okay, so that's where the code is being written. Okay, now the question is, well, I didn't go to, you know, blah, 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 slash welcome, slash index, right? How did it end up here? Well, that's just simply because here at the bottom of our bootstrap file, we have where we set our routes, and you can see that they, have, they set some defaults for you. The default controller is welcome, the default action is index. So that's why when we put nothing in there, it just automatically went to the welcome controller and the index action. Okay, everything makes sense so far? All right, so now you can't, you can do more than just go to a controller and, and a specific uh, action. You can also pass in parameters to the controller, okay? So just as an example, uh, I'm going to add another, I'm going to add another action to this, um, to this controller just to show you. So let's call this action echo because it's just going to tell you whatever you uh, give it. And so, I'm basically going to grab a parameter that's going to be sent through me through the routing program. Okay, and as you can see here, um, <coughs> this line right here, you can see that this basically means like, okay, you have controller, and you have a slash, and you have an action, and if you have another slash, then after that, we're going to call that that's going to be parameters, and we're gonna, because we have this name ID with an angle bracket, that means that we're naming this parameter ID. So later in my in controller code, if I want to grab a whole of that parameter, I can just sort of use the code I wrote, like find a parameter named ID. <coughs> Oops. Okay, so that's what I did here. And I'm just going to return and say, you said that, okay? 
And so now if I go to our website, I go to c slash class slash welcome slash echo slash, you know, hello. Oh, that's right. There's one step I uh, left out. So this is, this is part of the live coding idea. <laughs> so here's one thing. Let's see. Yep, so normally by default, a lot of these web applications, you have to include this index.php thing in your URL because you know, the idea is that index.php is sort of the entry point of your application. But of course, that's sort of annoying to have, right? Like you don't want to have index.php appear in your URL. And pretty much every web framework just out of the box has this index.php problem. And so you have to take some measures to be able to remove that, OK? <coughs> and so in this case, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use a file called .htaccess. And this is something that is specific to the Apache web server. And it can do things like rewrite URLs and redirect URLs and so on and so forth. Okay. And Khan is nice enough to provide a template.htaccess file that we can use. As you can see, there's a file there called example.htaccess. Okay. And we're just going to copy that to .htaccess. Okay. And I'm just going to open this and edit it. And basically, it just does a bunch of different things. Um, the, the sort of key line you may want to look at is right here. Basically, the idea is that you know, um, this is sort of sets up a rule that says, OK, anything, whatever you type in, OK, just sort of prepend index.php to that. And you can kind of see that the dot star stands for anything, like match anything. And then the second part is index.php slash dollar zero. And dollar zero refers to whatever was matched previously. Okay, does that make sense? But the really key thing I want to change is change this rewrite base, which is sort of the URL base. It should sort of uh, assume that you're working from. Okay, and I'm just going to add CS50 Kahana to that. And that way, now if I remove the index.php, it should work. And I'm oops, just going to add some numbers to show you that it indeed did work. Okay? Sounds good. Any questions so far? Can you just know to make sure once you create the like is it like an argument that you create? Exactly. You can think of it just like an argument. Exactly. Because but it it's the weird thing though is that um the way Kahana does it is they don't do it exactly like an argument. You kinda have to grab it like this. Uh, you have to grab the request object and then ask for the parameter that's named ID. And that name ID comes from that bootstrap file. That I showed earlier, and the name ID was like sort of in those angle brackets, and that's how you sort of grab those parameters. Okay. Awesome. Any other questions? Okay. So, like I said, controllers they handle the application logic. So that's sort of one instance where you can see that's kind of it's very basic, but still application logic. The idea of grabbing the parameter and then just sort of creating a new string that says you said blah and then spitting that back to you. Okay. And generally, what you do is you create different controllers. You create separate controllers for different parts of your website. Okay, so today, we're going to make a very simple website. And we're, it's just going to be a very basic blog. So we're going to make a new controller just for the posts in the blog. Okay? But then if I were to make also add comments to the blog post, then I would probably want to make a new controller for those comments. Um, if I want to add users, I would pro probably add a new controller for those users. And in general, the idea is that when you ha whenever you have a new model, a new sort of data object that you're dealing with, you have a single controller for that data object. So today, we're only going to work with one data object, and that's going to be um, posts. And also, you can think of data objects as corresponding to tables. Generally, each table corresponds to one type of data object. So you know, the post table will have one uh, post model, which will have one post controller corresponding to that. And same for comments, same for users, and so on and so forth. Okay? And that's a general rule of thumb. There is going to be special cases where you may, have, where you may differ from that. But 90% of the time, that's what we're going to be doing. And I'll show you that's what we're going to be doing today. Okay. One more sort of concept uh, before we dive back into the code, this idea of object relational mapping. So you guys have already done um, a web development uh, piece set. And you've seen that, OK, you make an SQL query. And what SQL, what it returns to you are rows. right? You get these rows, and you sort of index them by some name, the name of the, um, the, name of the column in the table. right? And that's how you work with it. And it can be a bit cumbersome. Uh, but furthermore, if you have relationships within your database, like for example, if I have comments and posts, right, then 
you know, maybe I want to grab the parent post of a comment. Um, if I use just rows in SQL, then all I can get is the ID of the parent post and um, not the actual post itself. But when we're coding, what we actually want is to actually grab the parent post itself sometimes, right? So what object relational mapping does is it takes the, the result of the database query and sort of puts that into objects for you, which are much nicer to work with than just plain arrays and rows. Okay, so for example, now when I have a comment perhaps and I want to refer to, I want to grab its parent post and I do maybe comment arrow post, then it will actually give me the post object corresponding to this actual parent post, not just some ID which I would otherwise have to use and make another SQL query to grab the post, which is just cumbersome and unnecessary. Okay, um, and furthermore, it, by you know, mapping all these data rows into objects, you can also attach more functions to objects. So for example, um, I talked about objects are, or classes are essentially just groupings of functions. You can think of it like that, right? So for example, maybe I have this post object, right? And maybe I would like to have some sort of function attached to it that's, that basically tells me, was it recently posted? Like, was it posted within the last week? Uh, true or false, all right? And that's a function I can sort of just attach onto that object and it's just really convenient to have it in the same place. And there are, there are a host of different functions you could create for um, these objects, and it's just really nice to be able to attach it to a, you know, to a class, to an object. Whereas if you had just had rows coming from your database, then you can't really attach any functionality to that, right? It's literally just data. Okay? Any questions about that at all? So ORMs are very common in web development, and there are a lot of different types of ORMs. Um, and Kohana has its own sort of ORM. It's very basic, but you'll get a taste of um, what it looks like. Okay, so let's create a model for our blog posts. Okay, and so the first thing we obviously need to do is to create an actual table within our database, right, to actually store the data for those posts. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is go to phpMyAdmin. Have you guys used phpMyAdmin before? Okay, awesome. So you guys already know what that is, and I'm going to create a new uh, table called Kana Posts, and it's going to be really simple. I'll have to log back in. So all we're going to do today is just have an author and a body. Just keep it simple. Yeah. So I'm just going to create that, that table. OK. And yay, so now we just have a table representing our posts uh, with just two fields for author and our body. OK. The other thing I am going to do now is configure my web application so it knows how to connect to the database. And this, again, is something that you have to do with all web applications. You have to tell it to, you know, the username and the password and the name of the database and so on and so forth to figure out how to actually connect to your database, right? So in Kahana, dear. okay, there we go. So in Kahana, we have something called a database module. And in the configuration folder, we have this folder called database. OK, and as you can see, there are a bunch of sort of settings you have to set here uh, to tell it you know, what's the username and the password uh, for the database so I can actually connect to it. OK? And since I don't want you guys to actually know that the username and password of my database, I have a file that I already uh, set it all up. And I'm just going to copy and paste it over. OK? <laughs> Awesome. OK. I think that's all the configuration I need to do. But let's see. We'll just, we'll just, keep, we'll just keep working. And if something crashes, then you know, we'll just fix it. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new controller. Or actually, no, sorry. First, I have to create a new model. So I'm going to create a new model called post.php. OK. And we're going to do is we're going to call it class model 
host get some syntax highlighting on and so by extending this by when I say extends ORM that basically sort of some more object oriented programming which Unfortunately, you guys haven't learned in CS50 yet, but it's pretty easy to pick up. It just sort of gives me all this extra functionality that comes in this ORM package, and so I get a bunch of extra functions and whatnot uh, just for free, which you'll see a bit of in a sec. Okay, so right now, actually, all I really need to do is just to create this class. I don't even need to make any function or anything, but I've created a class that represents the table, and because I've extended this ORM class, I just get a bunch of things for free, so for now, I don't have to set anything up, set anything more up, okay? And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new controller, which I'm just going to name blog.php. Okay. And I'm just going to copy over the welcome controller just so I don't have to retype some stuff. And now, um, right, I have to rename this. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, just to test to make sure everything's working out, I'm just going to grab the first post from my database and just print the body of the post on the screen. Okay, so to do that, what I'm going to do is first I'm going to save um, the posts to a variable. So what we're going to do is So in, in a Kahana, what you do is to grab the post object. It's kind of cumbersome, but you have to do this thing called ORM colon colon factory, and you pass in the name of the model you want. Okay, and it returns this ORM object that, re that represents that model. And then, like I said, when we extend the ORM object, we get all these methods for free. So for example, we get this new function called find all, which just automatically returns every single post in the database, which is pretty convenient. Okay. And now in the body, I'm just going to return the first post and returns body. Okay? And of course, I need to create a post. So let's insert a new post. And just say, Brandon, my very first post. Awesome. And now we're going to go to blocks. And if all works well, Oh, this is some other dumb file permission thing again. Hold on one sec. It's kind of absurd. Okay. There we go. Okay, so I just fixed that permission problem. It, it was trying to create some files and some log, and the permissions, again, weren't properly set. So I just added, made it so those files were writable and executable. Um, so it could actually, you know, actually log things. And so now it's giving me another exception saying class or I'm not found. Okay, and that's because I forgot another step. In the... That's too bad. So in the bootstrap folder file, there are these modules here, okay, which you can choose to enable or disable. And these are a bunch of different features that you can choose to use within Kahana, which is sort of nice. For example, they have an authentication module which you can use for authenticating users. They have a caching module if you want to you know, implement some sort of caching backend to make your application work faster and whatnot. Okay, so we need to uh, enable the database and the ORM module. Okay, because like I said, we're, we're using the database obviously, and also we need, to, um, we need to enable the ORM module because we'd like to have that extra functionality, which is really nice to have. Okay, so all I have to do is uncomment those two lines, and now if I refresh, Give me another error. It says class model post not found. Now this is a good problem to have. Um, and let's see. Class model post. Have to make it public. No. Hold on.
<laughs> oh dear. I'm actually not sh I do not know why it's not able to find that. That's really strange. I have this class right here. I guess I might have to... Oh. Oh, I am so dumb. I forgot to add a PHP tag. That's why. But now I have to undo that one change I just did. OK. There we go. There we go. So I, that was really silly. I just didn't add an opening PHP tag. OK, but as you can see, now it's working properly, right? We have one post. We grabbed the first post, and now we just print out its body. Great. Fantastic. OK. Any questions so far? Nope. Any questions? OK. So we just created a post model, very basic. Um, and the model, you know, we're going to add some functions later on where we can add validations and filtering. So validations are one of the things that frameworks solve for you really, really well. And I don't think you guys have to do this for your CS50P set. But if you, make, if you do web development for your final project, you're likely going to want to do some sort of validation, right? Like not having blank usernames, maybe having a password of at least some length, some things like that. And it's really cumbersome to implement these things by ourselves. And pretty much every single web framework does it for you and allows you to do it in a very clean way. Okay? And the model is where you generally express those sort of validation rules because it's sort of validating whether a model is valid or not. Okay? But for now, we're just going to uh, put that to later. And so for now, we're just going to work on another part. And we're going to try and make a new view that lists all the posts. Okay? So the steps involved in making a new action for listing all the posts is to grab a list of all the posts and then render the list of all the posts through a view. Okay? So right here, fortunately enough, we already have uh, listed, we've already grabbed all the posts using you know, this first line. Uh, define all function. And now what we're going to do is, you know, so far I've sort of been directly setting the, the body of the response just by passing the string. But now I want to use a view. Okay, and the difference between a view and a, you know, just doing this is that a view I can sort of have a nice big HTML template. And what I can just do is just pass it certain variables and then have the view automatically uh, populate its template uh, using those variables. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll create a new view. And I'll just name the view something like block slash index. OK, and I'm going to bind I'm just going to basically bind this. Oh, what am I writing? I, my brain is somewhere else. I'm going to bind the post, <laughs> the post variable to the view. So that way, the view has access to this post variable. OK. And so now I need to create this view. OK. So here we have this folder called views. And first, I'm going to create a new folder under that called blog, which is kind of nice. That way, we can sort of uh, have a nice hierarchy for our views. And I'm going to create another uh, file in there called index.php. OK. Awesome. Actually. Let's just have them both here. Okay. So now this is sort of making a view file is probably the simplest part of all this, and this is probably things that you're already familiar with. Okay, we're gonna do something really simple, you know, start saying like my list of blog posts, and then we can just go through and we're gonna sort of iterate through the post. Array, just you know, grab every single post and say something like, you know, maybe add a line and then and just sort of print out the author in the body. Okay, that makes sense so far. And let's see if it works. Nothing happened. I wonder why. Oh, I, I, I missed one step. Very silly of me. I just created the view, but I didn't set the view as the response. So you have to do one more thing. You have to do this response body and set to be the view. 
there we go. All right, we have our sort of heading, and then we have a post. And just for kicks, let's just insert another post, just so we can see a list. All right. And insert these two posts. And now if I refresh the page, we see all these posts here. OK? So does that make sense so far? Yeah, question? Oh, OK. Uh, so as you can see, we've, you know, we've been able to separate all these codes out into different sections. And you can see it's most clear with the view code. You know, this file here that uh, represents the view it only cares about representing data, displaying data. Okay? It gets past some sort of data, and all it does is just show it to you. Okay? And all other parts of your code don't have to worry about any of that. And similarly, your view code doesn't have to worry anything about how to access the database and so on and so forth, okay? which is really good and makes your code a lot more maintainable. All right. So like I said, views, they're dynamic in that you know, they, it's one piece of what's one file, but it will generate different views based on the uh, variables you actually pass in. And furthermore, there are a lot of different helper functions that you can use to help you write your code faster, which I'll show you in just a sec. So yep. Dollar sign view is a control, right? Uh, so the question is, is dollar sign view a controller? So dollar sign view is a variable I created right here. Yeah, so I just create a view first, I assign it to some variable, and then I pass it into this function, set as the body of the response. Does that make sense? So is view like colon colon factory wrapper, is view like a, a class or a library that's already been written, and then you're accessing the factory function of that? Exactly. So the, so the question is about the view colon colon factory function. And yeah, basically this is just some more object-oriented programming, essentially. View is the view class, and it has a method called factory. And that's just sort of a way to grab the object associated that's named blog slash index. Okay? And that's just some more object going to programming uh, stuff that I'm not going to go into here too much. <coughs> okay. So now, you know, obviously we want to create new posts, but we don't want to have to do it through the database. Right? So we're going to create a new action for creating new posts, and there's a lot of stuff we have to do. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do, we're just gonna tackle these things one by one. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is we've got to create a form for inserting a, new, um, inserting a new post, okay? But I'm also just going to add a new uh, action first. So adding a new action is just as easy as sort of adding a new function with your controller. And for now, I'm just going to just going to do something very basic, just sort of grab this view and just post it, just like display it for you. OK. And then now I'm just going to you know, create a new view file and just going to start writing some stuff. So what's nice about Kahana is that they provide a lot of different helper functions for you to write view code more easily. Okay, and one of those sort of helper functions or you know, helper modules is around writing forms. Okay, so for writing forms, I don't really have to directly write any HTML myself. And if you guys have written HTML forms, you know how it can be really, really painful and cumbersome to write forms, right? It's, it's not fun. So fortunately, we can basically write a form using Kahana's sort of form uh, helper functions to do it for us, OK? So maybe we'll, um, so we're just going to basically have uh, you know, fields for every single thing we have. So one for authors and one for um, the bodies. Okay. So we're going to have a label, and we're going to have an input. And then finally, we're going to have a submission. All right. As you can see, this was this is much cleaner to write than all that messy um, HTML, right? Which is kind of nice. Okay. Granted, you know there are other web frameworks that have it even cleaner than that, but you know at least this is better than writing the HTML yourself. Oops. Awesome. So this is what you see. 
Okay, so that's kind of messy. So I'm just going to add a, a line break there to make that look a little nicer. Well, of course, it still looks really, really bad, but we're just focused on the functionality for now, <laughs> not on the aesthetics. All right, no time to do everything. Okay, and as you can see, now we have a super basic form, which is kind of nice. I mean, this code is basically, I would say, is cleaner than trying to write an HTML form yourself. So that's nice. Okay, so what's next? Now we need to sort of do things with the, um, with the action. Okay, so normally, you know, when you write HTML forms, you have to tell it where it's going to submit the form to, right? So by default, in most web frameworks, it submits to the exact same URL. So the thing is, if you send a get request to, you know, slash blog slash new, it should display you the form. But if you send a post request to slash blog slash new with the data, then it should actually save that form, or try, sorry, try to save that post and do something with it, okay? So, what we're going to do is, basically all I have to do to check whether it's a post request or a get request is just to check whether the post variable is even set, okay? And if the post variable is set, then we're just going to try and create a new post. Okay, so again, we can just do this. And that just creates a new post. And we're literally just going to set its field like this. And then we're going to save it. And then I'm going to redirect to the index page so we can see our list of posts again, OK? So let's try that. Let's say Brandon. I'm going to submit the post. And if all goes well, as you can see, it redirected me to the index page. And if I scroll to the bottom, we have a newly inserted post. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and yeah, question? So what So by default, no, because by default, uh, oh, sorry, so the question is, um, if you enter the exact same data into the form and submit that, we'll allow you to insert a duplicate object, a duplicate entry, essentially. So right now, yes, it will allow you to do that, because in databases, you, it's perfectly valid to have completely duplicate rows. Um, but if that is a concern, then you can add validations, for example, to make sure that, OK, if this is exactly the same as something that already exists, then say that it's an invalid object. And then you can even return a specify your error message and say invalid because this already exists, something like that. But in this case, I could just uh, create something duplicate. Okay. So let's. So now let's try and add some validations. The problem with this right now is that. You know, I could literally just submit a completely blank post, right? I can click this button right now, and there we go. It, you can't really see it, but this extra line here indicates that I literally have a new post um, that just has a blank author and a blank body. And we don't want to allow people to do that, right? So this is where validation comes in. I can go to my model object, and now I can add a new function that specifies what validation rules I should add to this model to make sure that it is valid or to specify what, mean, what does it mean to be a valid post. And I want to say it's only a valid post if both the author and body are not blank. Okay? And this is how you do it in Kahana. You create a new function called rules. And then you basically return an associative array that defines the sort of validation rules for this object. So we're going to return the array. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say author goes to an array which goes to another array called not empty. And then I'm going to say body. OK. And the syntax for this and structure for this is maybe look a little cumbersome and a little complicated. If you read the documentation, it's pretty straightforward to figure out. But essentially, this is sort of what you need to do to specify 
um, some validation rules. And there are a lot of different rules that Kahana will give you for free. Like you can add rules to say, must be at least this length, maybe it has to be numeric, maybe it has to be off numeric, um, maybe it has to be at most this length, so on and so forth. There are a lot of different, different rules that um, Kahana provides for you, and you can just basically go on their website, like the documentation, and you can see all the different things that you can just do. Okay, but this is all I have to do. And now let's see what happens if I submit a blank post. What's going to happen? Oh no, I get an error. I get a validation exception. Okay, that's well, it's good, right? It told me that my model is invalid, but I don't want to display an exception to my <laughs> users when I when they try to submit something invalid, right? I want to give them some sort of friendlier error message when something goes wrong. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to is we're going to wrap everything in a try catch loop. So actually I think this is also something you have not learned yet in uh, CS50 because uh, C, the programming language C doesn't have exceptions, but almost every single other language has exceptions. So just really, really briefly, an exception is something that a piece of code can just sort of throw an exception when something goes wrong, but then maybe some other piece of code higher up can catch that exception and do something with it. So for example, in this case, the piece of code that's trying to save a model, you know, it validates the model, and if it says, okay, this, this model is invalid, it's going to throw an exception, okay? And this is kind of equivalent to in C, you might return like a negative one or something like that, all right? And then for me, you know, this function, my code, which is sort of at a higher level, I can try and cache that exception and basically say, okay, if I cache the exception, what am I going to do? Or I could choose not to cache that exception and let someone higher up catch the exception. Or just if nobody catches it, then the whole program just sort of crashes and says something went wrong and I couldn't handle it. Okay, but so what we do is, you know, you, you wrap a piece of code in a try block and then you also add a something called a catch block, which is the sort of code that will try and catch exceptions that may occur. And so if I catch a particular, this particular exception or invalidation exception, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the errors, I think that's how I do it, um, I'm going to set the errors to some object, okay? And then what I'm going to do is, you know, if it, you know, if it hits this exception, it's not going to redirect, right? And if it doesn't redirect, it's going to sort of come out of the if, the if block and hit, you know, this sort of a uh, block slash new, so which is what I want to do. If, if there is an error, then I want to sort of go back to the form and display those errors, right? So now what I want to do is I want to pass in those errors to the view, okay? Actually, I think I have the view right here. And basically, I want to display those errors if they exist, right? So before I write the HTML for that, I'm just going to really quickly show you what the structure of this errors variable looks like. And this is just a good practice in general. A lot of times, you know, you get something back from some method, some function that in the web framework, and you don't know what the variable looks like, so you don't know how to work with it. So I'm just going to use a print R method to basically um, print it out. Okay. And as you can see, it sort of tells me it's an associated array, and you basically have like, you know, a key author points to this string, author must not be empty, and another key body points to another string, body must not be empty. Okay, so I'm like, okay, cool. Um, then I can basically just sort of iterate through the array and sort of print out every single message. Okay, it's basically just like a, an associated array with a bunch of messages. Okay, so what I'm going to do is if errors, oops, then I'm going to create an unordered list, and I'm just going to iterate through all the errors. And remove this. And now I'm going to try submitting this again, and let's see what we get. Now we get this nice little <laughs> list of errors. And this is still pretty ugly, but this obviously can be formatted to look nice. But the basic idea is, you know, just in a few lines of code, we were able to validate our model, make sure that it wasn't, you know, certain fields weren't empty, 
And if something went wrong, then it would return me some sort of error message which I could then present back to the user. And you can also customize your validation so that you can actually have you know, more, maybe uh, error message that is more specific to your application or something like that. Every, all of that is generally customizable. Okay? Um, so unfortunately, we're running out of time, so I'm going to have to cut off the live coding session here. Um, there are a bunch of other uh, features I want to demonstrate for you in this um, example. Um, for example, you can add templates to your site. So maybe there is some sort of HTML code that you want to apply to every single page in your site, right? And instead of sort of you know pasting that in every single t uh, view file you have, which obviously would be bad, a bad, bad practice, you can basically define these templates and then in your controller say, okay, I'm using this template. Uh, use have my all my views use this template. Okay. And the one last thing I want to demonstrate to you as well, but we don't have time for, is cross-site cross -site scripting. Um, and basically, I think you guys have probably seen in CS50, I think David Malin probably talked about, you know, you can usually inject JavaScript code into, has, has he talked about this? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> but a lot of times, you know, you can in inject malicious JavaScript code into someone's database, and if they don't escape that properly, then when they present that data back to the user, then it may run some sort of random JavaScript code you don't want to happen. And I was just going to demonstrate how you do that within Kahana. It's actually really, really easy. Actually, I could do it right now in like two seconds, literally. Um, all you have to do is basically just wrap these things in this thing called HTML entities. Oops. And that will just automatically escape all the, uh, all the characters properly and make sure that you don't get any sort of this problem. Oh, whoops. <laughs> yep. OK. So that's all I had to share with you for today. Uh, there are, you know, these slides are going to be posted, but these are basically generally the only resources you really need to get started with Kahana. You can go to the website. They have a user guide and also have an API explorer. We can explore all the different functions and helper functions they have for you. Um, they generally have enough information on the website that you can use just to get started and get going with Kahana. Um, there, are also, there aren't that many tutorials, I think, for Kahana outside of what they have on the website here, so this is probably your best bet. Um, but if you want to go with the web framework and you don't want to have to pick up a new language and you want something that is re relatively lightweight and has an easy learning curve, I would definitely suggest Kahana. That's probably the best option for that. The funny thing, though, is, is if we were using Ruby on Rails, we could have replicated what we just did and probably more in under three minutes. No joke. But learning Ruby on Rails takes a lot longer than it would take to learn Kahana. Okay? So it's basically your choice on what you want to choose to learn. But if you want to basically just get up and running quickly, Kahana is definitely a very good choice. All right. Any last questions before we end? Yes. Yeah. So the question is how we would integrate that with a CSS framework. So what we would probably do is it would probably include a new folder where we would dump all our CSS files, and then we'd also add a new template. And in the template, we'd include like includes those CSS files to make sure they're referenced in every single page. And then that way you can just and then when you actually uh, write your HTML, you just add the appropriate classes and whatnot. And for example, when you're using something like the form um, helper function, if you add there. You can add more parameters afterwards to specify what classes you want to be attached to various things so they get styled properly, and that's basically how you would go. Okay? Any other questions? Awesome. Well, thank you for your time, and thank you for coming. <laughs>
suppose that you're moving your website from one domain to another, right? And if you just wrote out the uh, URLs yourself, then you'd have to change all the URLs, okay? Or maybe you moved it from one subfolder to another subfolder, right? You'd have to change all those URLs yourself, and that's, that's, that's no fun, right? So you can just basically use this anchor here, and it'll basically, you know, you can change uh, the domain or the sort of subfolder prefix in the configuration file once, and then it'll just apply that everywhere. And this is, again, like, a great example of do not repeat yourself, drying your code out. Wherever you're repeating yourself, try and extract in some sort of configura configuration file or to a different function and have it handle that for you. Okay, and the very last thing that I wanted to show you was, you know, suppose, you know, we're back at this post and, you know, I had, I had composed some really long essay, right, but I forgot to include my author. Okay, now when I click Submit Post, I just lost everything, right? No, <laughs> really sad. <laughs> but, so, so how, how do we deal with that, okay? So this is what we do. What we do is here, for these input and text area functions, if we include a second parameter, then the value of that second parameter is going to be what the field is going to be initially populated with, okay? So what we could do is, In our blog controller, we could bind another variable, call it values maybe, and just pass in the post array, literally. Okay, so that means that if the validation failed, then just you know, pass me the post array that I sort of submitted from the last request, and that way I can use the values from my last submission to repopulate the fields. Okay, so now I can basically do something like values author and values body. And that way now, if I do some random stuff, and click Submit Post, then it stays there, okay? But we're gonna run into another problem. That works, but if I go to the page the very first time, it's gonna crash. And that's because the very first time we go to the page, the post, this post variable has not been defined yet, right? It's sort of null, it, it doesn't exist. Okay, and sort of what we want to say is like, okay, if this key exists, then you know, uh, then just print this return like the value of this array. But if the key doesn't exist, then just return a blank string, right? That's sort of the functionality we want here. We want to check if the key exists before trying to access the array. And fortunately enough, Kahana also gives us a helper function for that. They have this uh, whole suite of functions under the name ARR, short for array. And they have one function called get. And you can pass in the array. And you can pass in the name of the key. And then basically what it will do is it will try to get that key. And if, but if that key doesn't exist in the array, then it will return blank. Or you can also specify a default, I believe. Okay, which is nice. All right, so now if we do the same thing again, then you'll see now it works the first time around. And again, if we just type in some random stuff and try and submit, then it stays there, okay? And yeah, that's, I guess I can also add a template, show you how to add a template really quickly. What we can do first is we can just add a new uh, view, call it just template.php within the views folder, okay? And what I'm just gonna do is I'm gonna print out something called content, okay, just, which is gonna basically be my, my main content. Okay, and maybe at the very bottom, I'm just going to add, say, like, you know, copyright. Okay, so this, maybe this is a super basic template I want to use. I want to have a footer with my copyright on every single page. Okay, and now what, what I'm going to do within my controller is now instead of saying extends controller, I'm going to say extends controller template. Okay, and now instead of saying response body is equal to this view, I'm going to say this template content is, and I think, do I put an equal sign or forget? Yeah, I thought so. And now I basically just set that content variable to equal the view. Okay, I can do the same here. And now if I refresh, 
You can see now this copyright is added there, and you know, this makes the RAM post. And then again, you should see that the copyright at the very bottom of the page. All right? Great. That's all I wanted to show you guys. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs>